Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ, uh, May the 8th worship service. Remember that we're still uh, having our parking lot service for those who don't want to come in. Uh, but we also have those people who want to, who need to stay at home. And so remember to have your <coughs> communion cup, your your sermon outline if you can get one, and the uh, grape juice so that you can partake of the Lord's Supper at the proper time. If you're watching this on video, all the songs will be on, on the video. And if not, uh, maybe you can get a songbook and, and follow along. Hopefully you have one at home and, and uh, worship God. Because remember, worshiping God isn't something we have to... We, can only do a church we can do it at home and worshiping god means that we're involved in the activity that's going on so if you can by all means participate in what's going on good to see you all here this morning glad the lord's blessed you to be here with us uh, happy mother's day to those of you that are mothers and thank you all of you men who made them into mothers uh, and and so so happy mother's day for for all of you and pray that god blesses you and we appreciate all your efforts in raising your children according to god's word because uh, that's what God really wants is for us to teach other people about him. Uh, Brother uh, Sandy is here, so there will be we worship. Today's we worship is Jesus calls his disciples, and that's going to be part of what they're going to be discussing. Uh, and Brother Don is going to be sing, doing our song service for us because um, Bill is out of town, and of course Tiny's no longer with us. And so we're down to a few song leaders, and so Don has graciously uh, decided to go ahead and, and lead for us um, this month. And so make sure we all sing loud and sing out uh, as he leads us in the song that he's going to be leading us. And the first song is going to be song number 683. So everybody grab a songbook or look online and sing along. The, the reason I'm singing this song or trying to lead this song is uh, I mentioned to uh, Randy and Rebecca here. That we, this is the song that um, Leroy liked to lead, and he did it in the second Sunday of January. And I had notes on that, and, and he really likes, I mean, Leroy, excuse me, um, Tiny liked to lead, and he led it the second Sunday of uh, January, and I had that on my notes. And he and I have talked about this when we were at Oak Grove, and, uh, and I'm sure his singing in heaven right now it's a lot better than mine here, so I apologize for that. But it's going to be amazing when we all get there and rejoice together in heaven. So let's sing this and uh, rejoice that uh, Jesus and God are taking care of time and all those that pass on to a better day for heaven. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver light that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friends. Trust his promises, friend. Sing and be happy. Press on to the goal. Trust. Things we know that are worth more than 
Make it through today? Okay, well, just hold on to his hand. You'll make it. Don't turn away from him because he loves you. <laughs> Good to see my brother Pedro here. How's your wife? She's uh, a little better, but she's outside. Okay. All right. All right, then. Well, that's good. Glad to know that. <clears throat> Beautiful day today. Amen. Another thing I like to do is uh, say Happy Mother's Day to your mothers. You know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be going through all these pains. <laughs> <laughs> you brought me into the world, and I was doing all right until the doctor slapped me on my rear. You know? <laughs> I was doing pretty good. I was sleeping, resting, and all that good old sleeping I was having. And all of a sudden, he, he hit me, and I didn't did anything wrong. 
<laughs> you know, he hit me on my bottom. I said, you know, it hurt, you know. But uh, I'm trying to get you in a good mood this morning. So, you know, we could all be happy and be just thankful that we are here among each other, loving each other, you know. Amen. Even though we got a lot of empty seats, but that's all right. We got a lot of people in the, anybody in the parking lot? Good. Well, thank you, Lord. Thank you for just letting me be here this morning to face my brothers and sisters and give you the praise and honor that you deserve, Lord. We are very grateful to you for the things you're doing for us and the things you have did for us. And I thank you for this. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for just waking us up this morning, Lord, and being able to face the things that we are facing this day. And I pray that, Lord, that you'll protect us from the evil one. And I pray that the decisions we make this day, Lord, will be godly decisions and righteous decisions, Lord, and we please you that we walk in your statutes and obey your commandments, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. May your grace be sufficient for us, Lord. Thank you. As we attend this service today and listen to the lessons being brought to us from our brother, Mike, who so diligently searched the scriptures for the words that he brought to us this day, will bring to us this day, we pray that something will prick our hearts, Lord, and just, and just move us, Lord. Move us and let us know that you are there for us, Lord, always, regardless of what goes on or what happened in our life, ups and downs, the bad things or whatever. You are there, Lord. And let us be glad, Lord, for she said you would give us life more abundantly. And we are supposed to enjoy this life at the best way we know how to please you and walk in your stature. Lord, thank you for this. I pray, Lord, that you continue blessing our, my brothers and sisters in the faith and that you help the sick, the needy, and the shed-ins, Lord, and the bereaved families. We pray that you continue helping us, Lord, so that the light will shine brighter at the end of the tunnel for us, Lord. And we'll reach that final day where we come to you, Lord, and really understand the things that you really want us to understand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. I could get on my knees all day long and just look up and say thank you. It wouldn't be enough. But Lord, thank you. Thank you for just bringing me through this battlefield that I'm fighting, Lord, spiritually and earthly wise, Lord. Thank you. May you be with us this day as we praise you and come to God and, and just be happy that you sent your son for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray to you. Amen. Amen. Sing the song, please. Coffee brewed in my place, Gandhi. 
redemption that gave us the opportunity for salvation the uh, terrible sacrifice you had to go through but the reward for us is so magnificent that it's implausible to understand but we, for, for, we are forever grateful for this sacrifice in Jesus name Amen, amen. Also on this day, as a convenience for the, the churches of the, around the world, that uh, we also pull our resources and our profits together, that we may continue His work, spread His word, help those be able to go up and have a great, uh, great presence with the God. So we're, let us pray for all that. Lord, there are so many gifts that you have given us. You have that you, everything you provide for us, including your sacrifice for us, that gives us life. And as we prosper here on earth with what abundance you give us, let us set aside some and give to others that we may help, especially give away, help the churches and the preachers to spread your word <coughs> and that we might go out and spread your word and that we give a part of our earnings that we may help 
that we go word out, Lord. We're thankful for all that you give us. There's so much that you have given us. We thank you in Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The song before the sermon is farther along. It's number five in the blue book. If you are able and would like to, could you stand at this time and we'll sing the song and then we'll have our lesson. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong, farther because they're taking care of their moms and a lot of times moms want them to attend where they go and so we're glad that uh, they're able to do that. Uh, as you notice, We Worship is on, so if you have children, uh, please feel free to take them to the back room and Sandy's there with them to teach them. John 17, verse 1. By the way, if you're here for the first time, uh, you'll notice that there are blanks in your sermon outline. Those blanks will be underlined on the overhead so you can write those in. That way you can follow along and keep uh, keep 
in track with us if you'd like to do that. Or you can just listen and we'll be happy to help you fill it out later if you want it filled out. John 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these things and lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You know, as we read this statement, it's kind of difficult and confusing for us to really understand it. But remember that the word by whom God created the world is going to heaven to receive his kingdom. The apostles were commanded to remain down here so that they might bear fruit. But that couldn't happen until Jesus completes his mission. So how will Jesus accomplish the glorification of the Father? Because unless you understand that is, in fact, what the mission of Jesus was. And really, as we go through here, it's also our mission. This is our mission, that is the mission of the Son who is praying to them. Let me remind you of what's going on here. Jesus had had the Lord's Supper. Judas goes off to betray him. Jesus talking with the disciples as they're moving from the Lord's Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that his time is about there. He told them that they were going to go off, that he was going to go off, and they misunderstood. They weren't quite sure, and they were sad. They were feeling abandoned that their Lord was going to leave them, the man that they'd spent three years with, who they called on for everything, for food, for the things they needed, for healing, for uh, uh, removing demons out of people. They had depended on him, and now Jesus is going to leave, and they don't quite understand it. Now, you and I live on this side of the resurrection. They live on this side before the resurrection, and so they don't quite understand There has never been recorded in human history any resurrection that was done without somebody being there. Somebody had to be there. When Elijah or or Elisha raised the woman's son, he was there. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he was there. When Lazarus, when Jesus gave life to that 12 year old girl, he was there. There is no record, there has been no record of anybody anywhere at any time just all of a sudden being raised from the dead without somebody being there. And so it's difficult for them to understand that. Now you and I, we understand that because we're on this side of the resurrection. They're on that side of the resurrection. So you have to put your mind where they're thinking in order for these words to really make sense for us as we read this, which is uh, often called, and you might even look in your Bible, the priestly prayer. Because this is a prayer that we have from Jesus to the Father as he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane and we know what's going to happen there. And so that's why it says, as he begins in verse 1, Jesus spoke, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven. See, Jesus had been talking to the apostles. He's been telling them that he's leaving. He's been telling them that they have to stick close to the vine. He's been telling them that they have to depend on him if they want to bear fruit. And he also told them, but I'm leaving. And so they were a little conflicted with that and a little depressed because Jesus was leaving them. And so as Jesus is leaving them, one of the things that Jesus does as he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, because generally we think of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, but Jesus actually prays before he gets there. And he's praying here, and as he prays, one of the things that he prays is about himself. He prays for his own work and his own mission that he's on. And that's why he says that he lifts it up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may be glo- may glorify you. And I think one of the reasons why this gives us difficulty or this section does as we read it is because we really don't go around talking about the word or using the word glorify or glorification. We generally don't use that word. We don't, we don't tell people, oh, you're glorified, or we seem, to, we seem to use that only as a religious word in church, and when we do, we kind of lose sight of what it really means. And so you might think, rather than the idea of glorify, 
Think of the word honor. Because honor is what we give to people who have been glorified. In, he, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 3, as the writer is talking to us, he says, For he, uh, talking about Jesus, for he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just a, a, as much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. And so here you have glory and honor. So as Jesus is glorified, we are supposed to honor him. So maybe if you think of honor, when you read the word glorification, it might help you in understanding what's going on here. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. You see, a, a Olympian receives glory when he crosses the line. He's the winner. He receives honor when they hang the medal on him. He's recognized as having that honor as being glorified, as being the one who is the fastest swimmer or the highest jumper or the whatever it might be. And so as we think about this in relationship to Jesus, it might be easier for us to think about honor instead of glorification because that's really what Jesus is getting to. Because when Jesus says, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, basically what He's saying is, look, I know who I am, you know who I am, but the world doesn't know who I am, and until they know who I am, they're not going to give me the honor that I deserve, and they're not going to give you the honor that you deserve, and that's really what Jesus is pointing out here. Because at this time, Jesus looked like a Son of Man. That's who He looked like. Remember in John chapter 7, when Jesus was going to go off to Jerusalem and his brothers came to him because there was a feast and they said to him in verse 3, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, what they're saying is, is you're trying to be a politician and politicians are always in the in the front of crowds and there's going to be a crowd in Jerusalem so why aren't you going to Jerusalem and why did they say this verse 5 for not even his brothers were believing in him you see they weren't giving Jesus the honor that Jesus deserved because they hadn't seen Jesus glorified Jesus hadn't won the race yet you might say and so they hadn't, or they refused to see him as being the one who was going to be the Son of God. In, verse, in chapter 10 of John, in verse 33, it says, The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. So as Jesus has been living, he lived 30 years in this world, and he didn't do a single miracle. And when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him, and he began to do miracles. But people didn't recognize him as who he really was. They didn't really recognize him for who he was in the beginning when John tells us he was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And so they didn't recognize him as that. And so therefore, Jesus is saying, people look at me like I'm just a, a, a good man like Elijah or like, like some rabbi who has the ability to do some miracles and that's the way they looked at Jesus. But Jesus must be honored so that the Father in heaven can be honored. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 16, he's talking to his disciples and this is what he says. He says, the one who listens to you listens to me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. And so you see this chain, you see this, this line that goes on. And basically what he says is if you want to believe God then you have to believe Jesus. You and I, if we want to believe uh, God, we have to believe Jesus who gave to the apostles and we have to believe the apostles. And that's why you and I are reading the Word of God. That's why we're looking at the book of John who was one of the apostles, one of those inspired men. Because if we don't believe that the apostles are inspired, then we're not going to believe what they told us about Jesus. And if you don't believe about what they told you about Jesus, you're not going to believe what, they told you, what Jesus told you about God. And so unless Jesus is glorified, nobody's going to believe in the Father. In John 12 and verse 44, 
It says, And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him, him who sent me. So Jesus says, Look, in order for me to glorify the Father, people have to know who I am. And right now, people are unwilling to accept who I am through the few miracles that He did. Even though He points out that those miracles should have been sufficient, they're still unwilling to believe Him. And so Jesus needs to be glorified. If Jesus is going to be able to do His work and finish His work, He needs to be glorified. It's kind of like you as a Christian. In order for you to be able to help people come to Jesus, people have to see you as one of God's people. If they don't see you as one of God's people, you're not going to be able to help them come to God. But if they see you as one of God's people, then you'll be able to help point them to the Word of God. They'll say to you, well, how did you become a Christian? How, uh, how was it that you were saved? And when you, they see you then as who you are, one of God's people, then you'll be able to help them by bringing them to the apostles, who then will bring them to Jesus, who then will bring them to God. And so it's exactly the same thing, except, of course, Jesus has the, the, the greater role in this. And, and that's why in verse 2 it, it says, Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that all who, whom you have given to him, he may give eternal life. In other words, Jesus says, Look, you're offering people eternal life, and I am the one who can give you eternal, who can give them eternal life. But unless they know who I am, they're not going to come to me for eternal life. And so, as Jesus begins to talk, he tells them that he has the right to determine the fate of man. In Matthew chapter twenty-eight and verse eighteen, after his resurrection, and before he goes up to the Father in heaven, he says to his apostles. Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That means anything that happens on heaven or in earth in relationship to us is controlled and determined by Jesus. He has the right, and He's the only one that has the right, to determine for you and I our eternal salvation or eternal condemnation. He's the only one that can do that, and He's the one we need to submit to and follow. And why is that? Well, that's one of the reasons He became man. Even God the Father doesn't control what goes on down here except through Jesus. And the reason is, is because Jesus knows how we feel. Jesus knows how we feel. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, that's Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus has get, been given all authority on earth to determine what happens for us because Jesus knows how we feel. You see, the fact is that if Jesus had not come down here and we all of a sudden appeared before God and God says, look, I'm going to judge you. One of the things I would tell God is, God, you don't know how I feel. You don't know what it's like to be human. You don't like, know what it's like to be limited in your power, to have to depend on somebody else for, for everything that you get. You and I depend on God for everything. God, you don't know what it feels like to be like that. You're all powerful. You're almighty. You know everything. But when God came down here, and when He lived like a man for 30 years and had to go through the same experiences of life that you and I have to go through, I can't say that to God now. God says, I know exactly how you feel. I was one of you. I was there. And so Jesus gets to have all power because He knows over us because He knows exactly how we feel. And therefore, He'll be fair to us and fair to God. And Jesus said, and I'm willing to lay down my life for my sheep. In John 10 and verse 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. 
Jesus says, I know my sheep. And he says in verse 15, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. You know why God the Father is going to let Jesus control our world? Because He loves us. Because Jesus loves us. You see, God didn't put the world under the, under the control of some sadistic, egotistical God. He put the world under the control of Jesus who loves us. And how do you know He loves us? Because He's willing to give His life for his sheep. That's why God allows Jesus to be in control of the world because he loves us. Because Jesus doesn't want somebody in control over you who doesn't love you. God doesn't want somebody in control over you who doesn't love you. Because isn't that the way we feel about our kids? I don't want them working for some boss who only cares about money and doesn't care about them. I want them to work for somebody who cares about them and on making a profit. I want my, my sons and my daughters to marry somebody who loves them and is concerned about them, not just getting a maid or, or, or a handyman. We want somebody in charge of our people who love them. God in heaven goes, I love you and my son loves you. And that's the reason why my son gets to be ruler over the entire world. And the way you will know that he loves you is he's going to die for you. Verse 18 continues. And no one has taken it away from me. Jesus, Jesus is saying, God isn't commanding me to do this. The Father in heaven isn't saying, Jesus, you need to go do this. It's a commandment. No. In the plan of things, as God was planning things, and God created Adam and Eve and made them before we were even made, God apparently had this discussion up in heaven, and the, and the Word said, if anything happens to these people, I'll be willing to die for them to save them if they'll believe in us. He wasn't commanded to do it by the Father. And that's what I'm afraid that sometimes we think when we read God's Word and Jesus says, He who loves his life more than me is not worthy of me, we say, God's commanding me to give up my life. Not really. What God is saying is it's just a fact. If you don't love God more than your life, then you're not going to love God enough to get to heaven. He's not commanding you to do that. He's telling you that's what it takes. It takes you loving God more than our very lives. And in verse 18 he says, And no one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. That's why Jesus says, Father in heaven, you need to glorify me so they can understand how much you love them and care about them. Because when He died, He died for our good. In Isaiah 53 and verse 11, of course, you know the verse. The suffering psalm chapter says in verse 11, As a result of the anguish of His soul, He, that's God in heaven, will see it and be satisfied. And by His knowledge, the knowledge of Jesus, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as He will bear their iniquities. So why did Jesus die for us? To glorify. To be glorified. And therefore be honored as He ought to be honored. In Hebrews 5 and verse 8 He says, Although He was a Son, He learned obedience from the things which He suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey Him the source of eternal salvation. And you might say, well, wasn't the Word God? And isn't the Word perfect? Why does it say He became perfect? Because that's what it says. It says, and having been made perfect, 
I thought he was perfect. Well, he is as far as his, his nature with God. But in order for him to perfect the ability to save us, there were certain things he had to do. He had to come down here and live among us. He had to be faithful to God during his life. And then he willingly had to give up his life. And he did those things. And as a result of doing those things, then he became perfect for the salvation of mankind. And so Jesus received the authority so that we might understand that God really does love us. And so He can offer eternal life. He offers eternal life. You remember in John chapter 2, when Jesus went in, the very first time He went into the temple after He had been baptized, and there were the money changers there, you remember what He did? He overthrew the money changers and drove out the oxen because they were making all that noise and people couldn't work. You remember that? And he said, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer. You remember all that? And then they came to him and they said to him in verse 18, and the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? In other words, they're saying, what gives you the right to do this? And he says to them, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And most of us don't even understand that. Because most of us think He's just saying, oh, you kill me and I'll be raised from the dead. Yes, He's saying that, but no, He's saying more than that. What Jesus is saying is, the reason I have the right to do this in my Father's house is because I love you. Because how do you know God loves you? Because He gives up His life which He will raise up for you. He's going to give you His life. And that gives Him the right to do what is good for you. By the way, what gives you the right to do stuff for people? Love. If you love them, if you don't love them, then you don't have the right to babysit my children. If you don't love them, you don't have the right to make laws for us. If you don't love the people. If you're more concerned about your political party than you are about what's good for the people, you don't have the right to rule over us. Amen. Because what gives us the right to influence people's lives is whether we love them or not. And that's what some people don't understand. That's why God gave us those little bitty babies that are so dependent on us. Because you're going to have to love them. You're going to have to learn what love is as they're growing up. Jesus said, you destroy this temple in three days I'll raise it up. And that's going to prove to you that I have the right to do what's right. Because He is the Messiah. He will be the Messiah. He is the chosen one in Acts 2. and verse 33 it says, Therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. When Jesus ascended up into heaven, He sent down the Holy Spirit to prove that He was now ruling and reigning in heaven. And all those who want to be under His rule can be if they submit to Him and follow Him and serve Him. He is the Messiah. And I want you to know what kind of Messiah He is. He loves you so much He'll die for you. He's not going to make a rule or a law that isn't good for you. He isn't going to give you something that just tests you for the sake of testing you. He only gives you those things that are going to be good for you. And therefore, He can offer eternal life. In Hebrews 1 and verse 3 it says, And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. And when He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, before He became king, He said, I need to make sure that people can be here with me. And therefore, before He became king, he died on the cross 
to deliver us from our sins, to pay the price for our sins, so we could live under His rule and be with Him. He offers eternal life. Because salvation is only offered in His name. In Luke 24, and verse 46, before Jesus goes up to the Father, after He had been raised from the dead, He's talking with His disciples and He says to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So how is forgiveness of sins offered? In the name of of Jesus. What can bring people to repentance? The name of Jesus. And so as a result of Jesus, people can have that relationship with God and be given eternal life. And then he says, in verses 3 and 4, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He says, and what is it? Why is it that I want to be glorified? So that people will understand God. Because if you don't understand God, then you're not going to be saved. If you think God saves you because you're in some church, you misunderstand who God is. Because eternal life comes by knowing God. You've got to know God. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 it says, And without faith, you know what faith is, right? Trust. And without trust it is impossible to please Him. Why is that? For he who comes to God must believe that He is. And that He rewards those who seek Him. God says you've got to know two fundamental things. You've got to know, number one, that there's a God. The world is telling you there is no God. It doesn't matter how you live your life. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what decisions you make. As long as you don't really hurt anybody. God says, no, there is a God who made you, who designed you, who created you, who made this world that we live in, who made everything to work the way it works. There's a God who created the whole solar system that you have out there that you and I can't even imagine. There is a God and secondly, you have to believe that He's the one that's going to reward you. It's not your parents. It's not your boss. It's not you. It's God. And Jesus is pointing out that if you don't know God, then you can't have eternal life. Because nobody else offers eternal life. He is the source of eternal life. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15, he says, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be glory and eternal dominion. Amen. And it says that... Uh, To Him be glory and honor. And that's not the verse I want. I thought it was. When I want says He is the source of eternal life. Yeah, we find it for you. I thought I had the right one up there. Nope, that's not the one I want. All right, I can't find it. But there is one. Uh, 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 you've heard it before. In uh, John 6 and verse 63, it says, it is, the, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The word that I have spoken to you is life. 
So it's the word that he speaks to us that is, that is life. And his spirit then is life. And that's what he gives to us, is, is this life. And this life comes only through Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse uh, 17, he says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And I think that's where my mistake is. Well, that's one. Thank you. Um, in First Timothy 6 and verse 15, he says, Which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, uh, uh, to him be honor and glory and dominion forever. Amen. And so those two verses indicate, just like this one does, that it's, the, it's God who gives us life. Nobody else has the right to give us life. Only, only God does and his spirit gives us life. And eternal life is only found through Jesus. And that's why in Matthew 11, verse 27, it says, All things have been handed over to, my, to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. So how are you going to know God? Through Jesus. And how are you going to know who Jesus is? Remember, this is pre, pre-resurrection. How are you going to know who, that Jesus really is God? By His death. And by his resurrection. And so he's asking the Father to help him during that time. Because Jesus and the Father are one. In John 9 and verse 14. It says, Jesus said to him, I have, been, have I been so long with you and yet you, do, uh, you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abides, who abide, abiding in me does his work. And so Jesus points out that him and the Father are one. You believe in Jesus, you believe in the Father. But if you don't believe in Jesus, then you can't believe in the Father. That's why John, 1 John 5 and verse 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So who has eternal life? God. How do you know God has eternal life? Because of Jesus. And how do you know Jesus is from God? Because He died and was raised from the dead and loves you and cares about you. And so God will be glorified in Jesus' completed work. That's why Jesus says in verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. In other words, Jesus says, I've been talking about you, Lord. I've been telling people about you, Lord. Jesus' work has been to glorify the Father. In John 4 and verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. By the way, when we become Christians, that should be our work. That doesn't mean you have to give up your job or give up your family, or give up your mother and your father. What it means is, is that in all those activities, we promote Jesus. And in all those activities, we are trying to help people come to Jesus. Our job, like Jesus' job, was to glorify the Father in heaven. And so Jesus reveals the Father to the world. In John 17 and verse 26, Jesus says, "Uh, And I have made your name known to them. And will make it known, so that, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Remember why I told you that Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it? So that you'll know that the ruler of the world loves you? The ruler of the world says, I love them, Father, like you love me. Therefore, we care about them. Therefore, we want to do what's best for them. And so Jesus says, I have made your name known. Now here's a good question. Do you make God's name known? When you're in the grocery store and somebody cuts in front of you, do you rudely reply to them? Or does the name of Jesus, is the name of Jesus seen in you? When your wife disrespects you in public, do you lash back at her? Or do you let the name of Jesus be seen in you? 
when your husband doesn't love you as he ought to love you, do you speak to him like the world speaks to him? Or do you let the name of Jesus be seen in you? You see, the name of Jesus is not something that we do at church. It's not something that we just use for praying. It's are we letting the love of Jesus and the light of Jesus be seen in us, or are we responding like the world does, yelling and screaming at each other? Jesus says, I've demonstrated your name to people. They tried to kill him. And he didn't bring down curses on them. They crucified him. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, the name of Jesus, the name of God is more than just his authority. The name of Jesus, the name of God is how he acts. His disposition and his character. People were hungry and he fed them. People suffered loss and he restored them. People needed stuff and he offered it to them. Jesus says, I've been revealing the name of God to the world. And I've made known, I've made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love which you, uh, which you love me may be in them and I in them. You know why some people act hatefully and meanfully? Because they don't think they're loved. When you're loved by God, nothing else matters. Nothing. Hebrews 2 and verse 12, he says, And I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. So Jesus has been making God's name known to the world. He's been telling them about God. And who God is. And so there's one thing left for Jesus. And that is he has to actually finish his course. He actually has to be, he actually has to complete it. And so in verse 5, he says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world, be, the, before the world was. Jesus says to them, Father, they're not going to believe me until they see the glory that I had. Until they see that. Because Jesus, as I pointed out, didn't look like God. Because when the Word became flesh, He gave everything up that would make Him look like God. In Philippians 2 and verse 5, He says, Have this attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus. Who? Although he existed in the form of God. You see, he was God. He was just like God. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't hold on to that idea of, I'm God, I want everybody to know I'm God, and look, I'm God, and therefore I'm not going to do anything if I have to give up being God. That's what we do. I demand respect in my house. If I don't get respect in my house, and things aren't going to go well. Well, sometimes you might not get respect in your house, and you still got to love them. Jesus, the Word, was willing to give up being God to help us. He looked just like us. And it says, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. He was made exactly like us. And what you have to understand is that he was made like us, but he knew who he was. And that would make it even harder. How many of you, probably none of you in here, but how many of you have ever had a maid or somebody to clean your house for you? Have you ever had somebody do that? Okay. So some people, you know, they hire somebody to come in and clean their house, right? And their house gets clean. What happens when the maid doesn't show up for a month? 
all of a sudden it's harder to clean their house than before they had it made. Isn't it? Because they're saying, I'm not used to this. I, I, I didn't have to do this stuff before. I had a maid. They took care of me. Could you imagine somebody who grew up with a butler and a chauffeur and then all of a sudden they have to drive and fend for themselves? Well, the Word could do whatever He wanted, whenever He wanted, however He wanted. And yet He gave it all up and became a man. And He couldn't do what He wanted anymore. He was now limited. He couldn't go everywhere he wanted. He was limited. He was limited. And he gave it up for us. And on the cross, even worse than that, he didn't just look like a good person, he looked like a criminal. They ridiculed him, they mocked him, they made fun of him. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 38, at that time two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. He's a common criminal, look! They have him hanging on a cross. They don't just hang anybody on a cross. He's in the middle of two thieves. And that's the way they saw him. And forbid our children make us look disrespectful in front of their friends when we when they get home we'll take care of them i'm not giving up anything that makes me me just so somebody else can get something cuz that's the way our world is but that's not the way jesus world is He looked like a common criminal. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3 it says, And he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. They said if he's the son of God, he should be able to come down from that little cross. Why that would be such an easy thing for God to do. And little did they know, had he come down, you and I would have been hung on it. Because the resurrection is going to vindicate who Jesus is and vindicate his mission. And in verse 5 he says, the last part of verse 5 he says, Now Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was Jesus says put me back the way I was in Hebrews 9 and verse 14 his death is the means of our justification he says how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead work to serve the living God but he had to suffer. And he told them that he was going to suffer in order for this to happen. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 31, he says, Then he took twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Jesus said to them, I'm going to suffer. And you ought to tell your children when they're growing up, you're going to suffer. You're not going to be happy every day of your life. You're going to, not, you're going to think life isn't fair. But you're going to have to suffer. You're going to get married and you're going to think she's the most wonderful woman in the world. And then all of a sudden she's going to start to do things. You're going to start to see habits that start to annoy you. And you can either dump her and think you can find one that's going to please you or you can learn to love her and suffer those little 
perfect imperfections that come along. If you think you're going to be a school teacher and your students are just going to love you, the first thing they're going to have to tell you is you're going to suffer. They're going to call you names. They're going to tell you you're not a good teacher. Their parents are going to come and want to sue you because their kids don't learn stuff. If you want to be a handyman and think everybody's going to love your work, you're going to suffer. Because some people after you do it aren't going to want to pay you. And some people aren't going to like the work that you do. Suffering is part of life. Whoever told us that our our work is to be happy and content, well, it is if you understand what happiness and content is, but that, that doesn't mean getting everything you want. Jesus says, I told you you had to suffer. If you love people, you're going to suffer for them. Loving somebody always requires suffering. But his resurrection would prove his identity. In Romans 1 and verse 3 and 4, it says, Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. What proved that Jesus was worth taking control of the world? Was the fact that when he died, God didn't leave him dead. God raised him from the dead and proved that he was worthy. What is it that proves to your wife that she really can't trust in you being her husband? Is because you overlook those little things that often annoy you. And she knows she can trust you. That's what God is telling us. Jesus had to die. He had to suffer to prove his love for us and to prove that the world that he loves the world. And that's exactly what he did. And his resurrection vindicates him. And his resurrection vindicates everything he said about God. In John 10 and verse 25, it says, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name. These testify of me. Jesus says, at least if you don't believe me, believe the works that I'm doing. How do you know your parents love you? What have they done for you? What have they done for you? How do you know God loves you? Because what has He done for us? And so Jesus prays to the Father that His mission might be completed. Because He knows that mission needs to be completed in order for Him to prove that God really does love the world. Because without our knowledge of God loving the world, why in the world would you want to trust Him? That's what the devil told Adam and Eve in the garden. And Jesus came to tell you the devil is wrong. God's word returned to prepare a place for believers and receive the kingdom. Before the disciples can bear fruit, Jesus must finish his work. And those who believe in the finished work of Jesus are baptized in Christ to know, to really know the Father. If you haven't done that, we encourage you to do that. If we can help in any way, let us know while together we stand. And while we stand. Faith is a victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in vales below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is Shouts of triumph trod. 
By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on our every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array. The tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread, and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Be seated, please. For the bill. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. Mike mentioned to you about me going to West Virginia this week. It's Hilda and I, large family, we have a lot of nieces, nephews, great nieces and nephews, they great, great, and maybe great, great, great nephews and nieces right there. They've been having a lot of rain back in that east, east part of the country, and then Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, they had a warning to flash flood. I've been telling my nephew, I'm going to bring us some California weather. <laughs> I looked on the map this morning, and it's just sunshine all this week coming. So, let on. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the members that are here this morning. We are also to honor this this day as Mother's Day, a mother that holds the family together. And we try to make our mothers happy because if mothers aren't happy, nobody's happy. And Heavenly Father, we lost one of our family members here a few days ago, the Howard's family. Father, we ask that you give them comfort during this difficult time that they've gone through. And our sister Lord has had a major operation. Father, we, we hope and pray that her recovery is short-lived and she'll be joining us very shortly. Heavenly Father, our world is going through a terrible time, near and, and far, with wars going on that was supposedly unnecessary, riots going on, people being shot and killed for no reason. Father, we need you more than ever these days to help the, our country and the world to solve these problems. And Father, we have a lot of members traveling this day to be with their family to celebrate the Mother's Day and to do some relaxation. Father, we ask for their comfort, their safe trip on their journey, and enjoy what you have provided for us in their travels. Father, we give thanks for our honored guests today. We hope that the word that they receive will be beneficial in their walk with Jesus and hope that they return again soon. And Father, as we travel this week about our daily life, we ask that you give us guidance in Jesus' way of living. And we thank him for all he has done for us and will continue to do so. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
have some cards here. Let me read these real fast to you. Uh, Pedro and Lourdes would like to thank you. Let me read their card. It says, uh, Hello, church family. Pedro and I want to thank you for all your prayers, cards, calls we receive. We appreciate you all for, for the outpouring of love, Pedro and Lourdes Sanchez. Uh, Pedro also uh, put in a card that said that his mom is in ER in San Jose with back pain and lots more health problems. She's 88, so if you could keep her in your prayers, he would appreciate that. Uh, and then Doreen um, says, uh, thank you for all your prayers and condolences for uh, her family uh, during her time of, of uh, grief. Uh, and also from a Gigi, she says, thank you for all your prayers, uh, answered prayer. I passed my exam to be for the administratorship and would like to request prayers for Liz and Armando. They will be taking uh, an exam as well Monday. Uh, and so uh, she'd like us to pray for them. And then it says, uh, this is from uh, Ellen Parker. Uh, she says, thank God for uh, uh, seeing everybody today. Prayers for family and for their spiritual relationship. And prayers for a friend, uh, Doran, I believe, who has COVID and is an unbeliever. And I'm praying God changes his heart. So there's a lot of people to pray for. Keep them in your prayers if you would. And then uh, just some real quick notes. Uh, Keep the lows in your in your prayers. Apparently, their daughter is getting better, and so we're really happy about that. But you might keep her in your prayers for a little bit longer, uh, and then uh, also uh, pray for Lorraine. She's going to be having some surgical procedure to put in a new place for them to do dialysis, and so she'll be having surgery. Keep her in your prayers if you would. And uh, Chad, Bill, and Linda, and Troy, and his family—they're all out of town. Keep them in your prayers, and I hope they have a safe trip back. And then next Saturday, this coming Saturday, May the 14th, is going to be our our church picnic at Lee and Karen's house. There is a sign-up sheet in the back if you want to bring something. And then a Ladies Fellowship is next week, and Leroy's still. Uh, wants people to help him with his ministry, and we need somebody who'd like to do the, the website. So if any of those things are things you might like to do or might like to help, we appreciate you and thank you, and thank you for being here, and you're dismissed. And let me see if this works. All right. <laughs>